It can be downright shocking how the world can change in just a few months. After 9-11, the US went to war against the Taliban, announcing an initial victory at the end of 2001, only then to begin a never-ending war against terror. The prophecy of Counter-Strike's infinite and futile battle against terrorism comes to life. In its name, they would build prisons where human rights didn't exist and secret CIA black sites on foreign soil where confirmed terrorists and possible terrorists were brought in for torture. One of them was built in my own country, just when we were coincidentally accepted into NATO alongside much of Eastern and Northeastern Europe. But at least we had confirmation of water on Mars. 2002 was a strange time for video games. We were living in a new world, not just because of the new millennium and all the terrorism, but because there were new platforms out there that required new games and new genres or reinterpretations of old games and old genres. Those that didn't manage to adapt to this new tide would be phased out. Old companies were beginning to be either bought out, like what happened to Interplay which was nabbed up by Titus, but still managed to give us a quite serviceable and very very fun Icewind Dale 2 before being completely taken over, or the companies were going out of business, and old series were dying in the process, 3DO having completely failed its attempt to create a new console standard, brought down with it new old computing, which with its dying breath gave us the final morsels of the Might and Magic franchise with an incomplete, unfinished and mostly terrible Might and Magic 9 and the Heroes of Might and Magic 4 that somehow managed to be actually quite acceptable compared to its RPG brethren considering that it wasn't finished either. It was a time of change for many series, of trying to find out where their limits were. Command and Conquer struggled a bit with its identity in the face of competition and became a shooter called the Renegade, one that was actually not half bad. One that featured a multiplayer mode that had you play as a unit on an RTS map, complete with resource gathering, unit production and the sense that you can't really achieve much alone. And in the face of the death of the arcades in the USA and Europe, series that were born on them had to adapt and evolve. That's how we got Midway's Mortal Kombat Deception, a new game for a new millennium, designed from the ground up for home consoles with long form progression and more depth to its gameplay than they could have ever fit in an arcade, mostly because nobody had the time or money to spend that much on an arcade. It sold 1 million units within just one week, proving that the genre had a new home, one with very eager occupants. Certainly it wouldn't make as much money as a coin-operated arcade cabinet version would have then at the golden age, but that age was long dead. In the face of a new audience entering the gaming space, an audience that hadn't grown up with the obtuseness of ancient games like Ultima for example, there was a push towards creating games concentrated more on ease of use, rubbing off layers of complexity and reducing idle moments, sometimes for the better, other times not so much. That's how we got games like Bioware's follow-up to Baldur's Gate, Neverwinter Nights. A very successful game thanks in no small part to its multiplayer mode that let you create your own adventures within a live editor, finally letting you achieve the dream of playing as an actual dungeon master. But it was a game that toned down the complexity quite a lot and made characters virtually immortal, at least in a single player campaign, unable to die and without any actual explanation behind it. A change for the sake of convenience that sabotaged the world building of a game that could have turned out so much better. It was a sign of things to come, though thankfully not a sign of things that were already being embraced by everyone. Because that very same year, we got a lot of RPGs that still adhere to the older traditions, like Divine Divinity, a game built on the core ideas of the Ultima series with a high degree of interaction with the world around, but with a combat system inspired by Diablo because the publisher convinced Larian Studios that they'd not really have a chance to sell anything if the game was turn-based. Turn-based combat was on the way out, adopting it would be 
Doom, or so they said. Another great RPG that we got that year which flew in the face of simplicity was Bethesda's follow-up to Daggerfall, Morrowind. A much less ambitious game than its predecessor that tried to go more towards a directed focus experience designed by people that were not the originators of the Elder Scrolls series. Still, it was about as open world and open ended as possible. It was a game that stood out in the way it tried to get you to understand this world. One where you'd be given actual directions for where to go, involving turning left at big rocks or being in a certain place at a certain time facing a certain direction. There was no go here on a map. There was a beauty in its design, there was depth in its design. There was a quality to Morrowind the likes of which the series hasn't really seen since. And it still clung to its role-playing roots. What with every swing of your weapon having a dice throw attached to it that superseded what your eyes were actually telling you. It may have looked like you had struck that cliff racer with your sword, but in actuality, your skill is only 20. You miss. On the other side of the combat spectrum was Arx Fatalis, the first game of Arkane Studios, a company founded by people inspired by games we've already talked about quite a bit in the past few shows. They had wished to make Oldama on the World 3. But when no one answered their call, they set about creating their own universe with their own game in it. And so we had a return to the original immersive simulator, a game where the world, small as it was, felt tangible, where all your actions had a physicality to them, whether it was the swing of a sword at the head of a goblin, baking a pie, or simply drawing a rune on a screen to cast a spell. Arx Fatalis put Arcane on the path to remake in their own vision Looking Glasses Studios' biggest hits. It took them 50 years to accomplish this. Other notable RPGs released that year were Dungeon Siege, a game akin to Diablo with not even a single loading screen once the adventure started. Somehow it became the foundation for a movie. Then there was Europa 1400 The Guild, a strange combination of RPG and the life simulator that was more akin to The Sims than it was to Diablo or Baldur's Gate. But with quite a lot of depth, progression and options to its gameplay, it was a much more involved game than The Sims was, though it did lack the house building component. We also saw the transformation of one of the oldest share RPGs in history into an MMO, with Final Fantasy XI, the primary console MMO for many many years, being wildly successful and long-lasting, it is still around to this day in 2018. Everything was trying to be an MMO in those days. Electronic Arts having abandoned plans for a Wing Commander MMO released, another space MMO called Earth and Beyond. It would be very short-lived though and almost forgotten once competition in this space heated up. And mind you, the MMO scene was heating up like mad. Ultima Online lit a flame, EverQuest turned it into a raging fire and between them the likes of Lineage spread it across the world and now you are seeing MMOs sprout up everywhere but especially in South Korea where internet infrastructure was a tad more developed than everywhere else. Games like Night Online and Ragnarok Online would open the floodgates to what would seem in half a decade like an unending torrent of a very similar and very repetitive games that somehow still managed to attract millions of people and continue to do so to this day. Magic the Gathering as well, one of the most successful physical real world trading card games ever made, moved onto the online space with Magic the Gathering Online. A very successful game that would not be outdone by any other similar title even a decade later in spite of how primitive its infrastructure was. Everything was evolving and changing. You probably wouldn't see it better than in Metroid Prime, a reinterpretation of the classic series in the form of an FPS with a heavy dose of immersive sim that managed to take a 2D side-scroller into the modern age with first-person controls, first-person shooting, first-person everything without skipping a beat. Even Mario himself would evolve with the 
less than beloved Super Mario Sunshine and The Legend of Zelda would get its most visually unique entry in the form of the cell shaded Wind Waker, of which I can probably not show you a single frame. And the GameCube also got the magnificently mind-bending horror game Eternal Darkness, a game that added an extra layer of dread by using the fact that it was a game to its advantage, toying with the player's expectations in a similar way that Metal Gear Solid 2 managed to do so a year before. But the majority of the gaming market was now moving towards two distinct genres. The first person shooter was on one side, and in this genre we had that here both Medal of Honor and the form that we know best, Allied Assault, which gave us a cinematic campaign that tried to evoke the realism of war which was sort of still seen through the prism of Saving Private Ryan. A heroic struggle, but filled with tragedy, with human suffering. And sort of on the other side of the spectrum we got Battlefield 1942. Though it was still a World War II game, it was a bit different. It was meant to give you the tools to wage war alongside your friends against dozens of other players in the same match on big maps with all sorts of vehicles. In its DNA we can very well see a bit of Star Siege Tribes, but it is more grounded, with a theme that's a lot easier to understand and is, for that reason, a much more successful franchise. Even so, there was still a bit of room for the FPS to evolve a bit, with games like Star Wars Dark Forces 3 Jedi Knight 2 Jedi Outcast. That was part shooter, part Jedi simulator letting you hack and behead your way through the Star Wars universe, force lightning and force gripping stormtroopers to your heart's delight. On the other side, the other dominating genre was the open world action game. GTA Vice City came out as a sequel to GTA 3 but with a heavier focus on story, character setting being a love letter to the 80s before it was cool, and expanded gameplay options going on to be that year's best selling games, followed by GTA 3 which was now being released on other platforms than the PlayStation 2 and was still selling like mad. But that year we also got Mafia, which looked like it was the same kind of open world action game as GTA 3, but it wasn't, instead Mafia was thought out as a more focused story oriented game taking place in a city that you would navigate through. But this wasn't GTA, though its sequels would be more like that. And in spite of all this, and in spite of StarCraft still reigning supreme, new RTS games were still coming out, but they were a bit different now. And one that exemplified this quite well was Warcraft 3 Reign of Chaos. Blizzard's return to the game that put them on the map may have been far from being the first one to combine RPG and RTS, but it did it probably in the most accessible way up until then, both in the magnificent single player campaign that had an excellent well told story, well presented story with superb cinematics and many many missions, and in the multiplayer mode, a mode that, like Starcraft before it, was customizable through the editor, and you can be sure that people did customize it. Often latching on to the RPG mechanic tied to its heroes and starting to make new versions of older mods, for example StarCraft's Aeon of Strife, only they would often not call it Aeon of Strife. One of the people that made their own version was a person by the name of Kyle Eul Sommer and he called it Defense of the Ancients, a simple game where you'd kill some neutral creatures to get some experience like you would in Warcraft 3 and its campaigns in the multiplayer as well, and then use that hero to defeat other heroes or destroy the base. No RTS component at all, just a very very small action focused RPG. And the core of it, 16 years later, is among the most popular games ever made. This is why I'm giving the title of Game of 2002 to Warcraft 3 Reign of Chaos. While Neverwinter Nights did go on to enable its players to create their own adventures, nothing at the scale of Warcraft 3 had ever been done before. Numerous genres and game ideas exist either because of its world editor or only in its multiplayer through that editor. Even to this day there is still a treasure trove of unexplored ideas that were pioneered by Warcraft 3's modding community and are just waiting to be made into their own games that may be successful, well probably not as much as Dota was, but will certainly find an audience in their own right. 
And it doesn't hurt that Warcraft 3 was in itself a very, very good game that even without the mods created the tower defense genre. But it's the mods that push it over the edge and make it the game that best fit, that best described this year. And with that, we end 2002. See you next time.